I'm currently breaking about 200 NDAs by posting this here, including some that stipulate decades, if not longer, jail time for me and worse. But frankly, whatever happens to me isn't as important as getting the word out, getting this warning out, to all of you who live in the United States, and perhaps the entirety of North America. If I attempt to leak the information I have anywhere else, the people in charge of making sure things like this don't get out will sniff it out in a heartbeat and erase it from the internet completely. So, I'm posting this here, on a place that is one of the last it possibly look, in hopes that enough people hear it and can warn others while there is still time. I'm not going to tell you my real name or what company I work for as that would be detected by those that sweep the internet for such things and would send up the warning sirens all around. It along with the other people's names I will need to use will be changed with fake names. But what I can say is that I'm a very high level scientist who works at a corporation that deals in large part with genetics and genetic engineering among other things. One which has a lot of notoriety and acclaim in the world. Roughly about two years ago, as the rest of the world was in lockdown due to the pandemic, the company I worked for was approached by the federal government, specifically the Department of Defense, to assist the top secret project they were undertaking for something which the paperwork referred to as Project Varanis. Only about half a dozen scientists and geneticists, myself included, were selected for our knowledge, skill, working speed, and most importantly, the ability to keep our mouths shut. They set us down in the conference room of our building, and after giving only a vague interpretation of what task they wished us to assist them with, in the words of the stooge who spoke of the three of them, to assist with our project on the genetic scale, they shoved non-disclosure agreement after non-disclosure agreement under our noses to sign. And the only reason we didn't question was because of the amount of zeros that we were told would be on our personal paychecks. We would be wealthy beyond our wildest dreams. Greed always gets people in over their fucking heads. After giving 24 hours to get our affairs in order, we were all piled into the back of a Zikorsky helicopter and taken to the local airport, where we were placed onto a military C-130. They didn't tell us what state we were heading to, and most of us were too excited about the money and the opportunity to care, murmuring excitedly to each other during the entire course of the six-hour flight. We landed at a private airfield, one which I'm pretty damn sure isn't on any aviation map, and led us into a large, three-story building made out of black metal just to the right of the runway. This turned out to be the barracks, what would become our home for the foreseeable future. And we weren't the only ones there. As we learned, about 10 or 12 of them were animal wranglers or animal behavioral experts. So whatever we're doing has to do with animals. Yurik, a Russian transplant and fellow scientist and a friend of mine whispered to me as the big wigs gathered us all after letting us drop off our personal effects. Apparently, I whispered back, what do you think the project is? He shrugged his shoulders. You've got me, Dexter. I guess we'll just have to find out, yes? I nodded, and we both fell silent as we were led back out of the building and through a grey metal door which was set into the side of a hill across the way. This turned out to lead down to where we would be working, an underground complex which had to have stretched out for at least a mile or more. As we entered the first clean room, we were met with the first big surprise of our arrival taking up its own clean room, which opened to the one we stood in with floor-to-ceiling windows, was a supercomputer which, by all means, should only be in the rough blueprint stage. If you've heard of the Hewlett-Packard Enterprise Frontier supercomputer, then you'll know that its successor, the Aurora, is due to be completed this year and will only be the world's second exascale supercomputer. Except, it was already built a year or two in advance. The Department of Energy had landed the ODIT for this project exclusively. We all whispered in hushed tones as one of the men rattled off the system specs, 
which I'll skip, as many of you will know or understand them. And then, they led us to the second surprise of the day, and admittedly, even a bigger one than the computer. And, in my personal opinion, far more chilling. Inside a room, which, unnervingly, had a row of cattle prods hooked into one far wall, along which, for some reason, a locked case containing what looked like shotguns, was another floor-to-ceiling window. The hit Big Wick walked up and tapped the glass. Our most durable glass, able to withstand a direct hit from a vehicle doing 20 miles an hour. We use it in secure rooms in the Pentagon, he boasted. For a moment, everyone looked around at each other in confusion, wondering why glass so strong would be needed in a lab setting. Until the three men stepped aside and let us finally see what the subjects of this project would be, earning more than a few gasps from myself and the others. The room, or I should more appropriately refer to as an enclosure, was made up to resemble what I can only describe as an Indo-Pacific jungle. I know, since I made a trip with my wife to that area of the world ten years ago. That wasn't what had earned the gasps, though. It was what lay and stood inside the habitat. Instantly, I understood the name of the project, which some bright bulb in the DoD hadn't exactly been creative with. Varanus was the genus of the animal before us. Varanus Komodoensis. Komodo dragons. There they were, from what we could see, about seven or eight of them. Some were sitting and sunning themselves underneath the artificial lights mounted in the ceiling, while others lumbered around lazily, rivulets of drool hanging out of their mouths. As we stared in astonishment, the DoD men explained the goal of the project. According to them, they wanted to attempt they wanted to attempt to weaponize the lizards, use selective breeding, genetic modification and animal training among other steps, to create the perfect killing machine for the black ops arms of the military in any location in the world. And it was our job to make that happen. Things progressed slowly for the first three to six months of the project. We took genetic samples of tranquilized specimen and fed them into the supercomputer to map out the animal's complete genome. Shockingly, it took the computer less than a week and a half to do so. Once we had a complete blueprint, we began removing genes and other molecular parameters that would hinder the new generation of Komodos to fulfill the parameters set down to us by the DoD. I won't say every single thing we did, but I will, for necessity's purpose, tell you some of the most important ones. Most lizards are cold-blooded meaning they can't regulate their own body heat and need the sun to warm them up. Almost all lizards are this way, with the exception of one. The Argentine black and white tegu is the only known reptile which can regulate its own body heat and thus survive in cold weather without going completely dormant. Using genetic engineering, we were able to rack the tegu's gene up to the point it would stay fully active all throughout the winter months and cold climates. We also removed genes which limited the Komodo's ability to see distinct shapes, and inserted ones which also boosted their visual range, allowing them to be able to see for at least half a mile away from them. We inserted chameleon genes to allow the creatures to naturally camouflage themselves for whatever location they would be dropped in. We heightened their sense of hearing and smell as well, along with increasing their skin density so that, short of a 50 BMG round or bigger, not much could penetrate their heights. The big one that the DoD wanted though, was increased aggression. Komodo dragons are already aggressive and territorial by nature. But for them, it wasn't good enough. And so, for this, we inserted the testosterone gene from a bull shark, which has some of the highest testosterone levels in the animal kingdom to boost their ferocity. Finally, all the parameters we were set were reached. And through a complicated process, which I won't go into for time's sake, we began inserting the new genomes into the clutches of eggs that the females would lay, and then returning them to their nests in the habitat. A few more months later, and the first genetically modified Komodo dragons were born. And 
they were a complete fucking disaster. Some of the animals were born with mutations that made them die off quickly, such as missing two feet, or in one case, two heads. We realized we'd made a mistake and went back to the drawing board. After checking, double checking, and just to be safe, triple checking our work, we attempted again with a new clutch of eggs. As the second clutch began to quiver and shake, everyone from us geneticists to other scientists and animal experts and even the 10-man security staff gathered around the window in anticipation. The first egg cracked, and a black head poked out from it, its tongue flicking in and out of its mouth, tasting the air. A few moments later, more began to do the same, and as the first forced its way out of the egg, seemingly mutation-free, we all turned to one another and applauded, cheering patting each other on the back and shaking hands. Congratulations, Dexter, an animal behaviorist named Michelle said, smiling and giving me a hug. I developed a friendly rapport with her, and we had fast become friends. Thanks, Michelle, I said, grinning back at her. But now comes the test of time to see how they do as they grow and mature. She nodded, and we turned to congratulate more of our colleagues. If we'd known then what we did now though, we'd have likely tried to incinerate the entire room while we had the chance. The animals matured at an incredibly fast rate from then on, reaching full sexual maturity in less than a year instead of the normal 8-9 to nine years due to the genetic modification. They soon took up large amounts of room in the habitat, as the 7 specimens which survived to adulthood, 4 males and 3 females grew much larger than their natural parents, reaching lengths of about 14 feet long and likely weighing over 500 pounds. We noticed a few new additions to the first generation comots, as we came to call them, to distinguish between the regular animals and them, such as their teeth having more of a shark-like serrated edge to them from the bull shark genes, and a more mammalian-like eye due to the chimpanzee genes for sight. Their natural skin color was dark black, much darker than their parents, and when they first camouflaged themselves, it was a sight that caused us to gasp and wonder. We had created a subspecies effectively of the animal. That was where the problems began. See, after congratulating us on our achievements, the DOD ordered us to begin the training process as soon as possible. They had some military skirmish coming up they wanted to give the animals a dry run on, about seven months out. And so... Michelle and the rest of the animal experts attempted to train them to attack on command. At first, it seemed they responded well to the orders, but very quickly petered out, ignoring verbal and visual cues. To make matters worse, they ended up turning on their parents, killing and devouring all eight of the natural animals during one night, which led us to walk into the lab the next morning, finding the glass splattered with blood and viscera. The comots had been absolutely vicious on the recordings, moving as a pack to trap an animal at a time in a corner before quite literally tearing it apart. This gave us pause, as we didn't recall putting any increased intelligence genes into the animals, and pack hunting behavior was not only a sign of intelligence, but also a behavior not seen in Komodo dragons. Everyone exchanged nervous glances with each other at this revelation. That was about the time they... changed. They began to get downright eerie, if I'm honest. We would walk into the habitat viewing room to find the animals standing still as stone. Still, except for their eyes, which seemed to follow you all around the room, one which began to seem far too human-like and understanding. I know now that they were learning our patterns, our movements, sniffing out weaknesses and vulnerable spaces. Hell, you could be two rooms away and still feel their eyes on you through the many layers of glass. They also began to camouflage themselves more and more, seeming to learn how to effectively hide themselves. When they stood still, it was almost impossible to distinguish them from the background. It was almost exactly the way the Indominus Rex from Jurassic World behaved. Only, there were many of them, not just one. We reached out to the DoD to explain our concerns, but they were pushed aside like paper. The man on the phone told us that the three who had brought us here over a year ago 
would be returning in two weeks to look at the specimens. That is final. The gruff voice finished, before hanging up. We were unsure what to do. The animals hadn't been trained, and their odd and eerie behavior was beginning to sow the first tendrils of doubt about what we had done into the backs of our minds. We had been too busy focusing on achieving our goals without stopping to think about the consequences, also preoccupied by the money we would be making. But we attempted to push the thoughts away. That's when the next shoe dropped. As we entered the lap a week later, we noticed some, well, some things nestled in the old replica nests that once held the Komats themselves. I have to stress that normal Komodo dragons, as it turned out, can lay up to 20 eggs at a time, which between three females would mean 60 eggs. There were closer to 90 eggs in total in the nests. Okay, something isn't exactly right here, Michelle said worriedly, getting murmurs from the other animal experts. They're not supposed to lay eggs so soon, especially not this time of year. As we stared through the glass, one of the comats uncloaked itself, the side of its head almost pressed up against the glass. Fuck me, I shouted, jumping back. I had been close to the glass myself, and when it had appeared, the two of us had almost been eye to eye with each other. That's when Dietrich, another geneticist, dropped the bomb he'd hidden from the rest of us. Unbeknownst to the rest of us, he'd been approached by one of the bigwigs with a secret assignment. Apparently, there were two secret parameters that the DoD had asked for in the Comarts. The first was an increased level of intelligence for problem solving and creativity skills using more chimpanzee genes. This alone caused everyone else to flip their shit. Are you and them out of your fucking minds? Clancy, one of the animal behaviorists, screamed at Dietrich. You basically engineered up the apex predator of apex predators, and then you gave it a fucking brain? Quieter than he had been before, he then told us the second secret parameter. They had wanted to increase the animal's lethality, and as such, had Dietrich insert the genes from one of the most venomous species of snake, the black mamba, into the comats. One bite from the animals would be enough to insert enough venom to kill 20 full-grown men. The discomfort and horror in the room was palpable. I quietly strode up to the men and asked them, in a voice quaking a little, Do you have any idea what kind of monster you've created? He merely stared at the floor and said nothing. I looked around the room at my colleagues and at the security standing behind us. After a few minutes of deliberation, I opened my mouth and spoke. We have to find a way to destroy these animals. I turned and looked at them, now all visible and staring through the glass at me. And they all seemed to have their eyes on me, and me alone, and almost seemed to harbor a sense of anger towards me. I looked down and saw that the speakers which allowed the trainers to try and communicate with the animals had accidentally been flicked on. If I didn't know any better, I'd say they understood what I said. But that was ridiculous. They only understood basic commands, not full sentences. Nevertheless, I nervously flicked off the speaker, then turned back to the group. We have to find a way to destroy them, I repeated, and began to move across the room to the weapons locker containing the shotguns. That's when the security guards stepped over to me. I'm sorry, sir but I can't allow you to even attempt to destroy government property," the lead guard said, his face stony and lacking any emotion. Are you serious? I asked, dropping formalities. He repeated his sentence to me. I felt a rising wave of panic begin to overtake me as my mind raced with the implications. But before I was able to do anything, I felt hands grab my arms from behind, wrenching them from behind. I felt handcuffs clench around my wrists and looked back up at the head guard. You're going to be placed into confinement until the superiors arrive here in three days, at which point they will decide a course of action for breaking subsection A303, paragraph 36, line 4 of your contract. They led me out of the room, 
the other scientists, looking both scared and upset at this abrupt intervention. As I left the room, I saw one of the guards rest his hand on the butt of his pistol while staring at the group. There is to be no more discussion about the destruction of these animals, he proclaimed loudly. The symbolism of his hand on his gun was obvious. And then, the door shut, and I was shoved forward. I was marched out of the lab and back across the ground to the barracks, where I was locked into a storage room with a toilet. Occasionally, a guard would bring me food and water, but they never spoke a word. I had nothing to occupy my time with but my thoughts. Thoughts about the disastrous implications of those creatures down below, breathing uncontrolled. Or worse, escaping the military's custody. Three days later, as I sat on the floor with my head between my knees, I heard the door unlock and looked up to see the carts in the doorway. Behind them lay two men in combat fatigues, carrying assault rifles, and beside them were the three pickwicks, still dressed in their smarmy black suits and ties. I was pulled out of the closet and held by my arms in front of the three. Doctor, doctor, doctor. One of them began shaking his head slowly. You disappoint us. He clucked his tongue. We thought you, of all people, would recognize the importance of such a project. The ability to create the perfect soldier. One that means not risking human lives and winning battles far more efficiently. I shook my head at him. What you don't understand is that, if you keep those animals alive, you risk something far worse and more disastrous for the area. Hell, the country and maybe even the continent. But he didn't listen. He waved at me. Escort the good doctor down with us to see. There's nothing to worry about. He said dismissively, already turning away. This time, in between the two rifle carrying military police, I was marched back from the barracks to the lab as they shut the door behind us. One of the suit wearing men locked the door out by pressing his hand into a scanner at the bottom of the stairs that I hadn't noticed before. When we entered, all eyes turned in our direction, and I could see the guards had been forcing them to continue working under duress. Many looked like they hadn't slept in two days. On the big wick's orders, we were all forced into the observation room. When we entered, I noticed something that nearly rooted me to the spot. There was only two comats visible in the center of the room. Both lay slumped on their sides, their eyes open and unseeing. Instantly, the head suit turned to the guards, his face turning red. You allowed two of them to die? He shouted at the head of security. The man's face turned pale as he stared in confusion. N no sir, he stammered. They were up and moving about not even an hour ago. But the suit wasn't comforted. He rounded on Michelle and Clancy. You two are going to go in there under the supervision of two of the guards, and you are going to attempt to revive our property," he hissed. They began to protest, but then the men shouted again. If you do not do as ordered, by the power given to me and your contract, I will have the ability to have you executed for insubordination. The two animal behaviorists looked shocked at the men's words, but still didn't move. Not until the security team pulled their pistols out of their holsters. Michelle began to cry, and Clancy attempted to comfort her. But the suit strode forward, grabbed the two of them, and roughly shoved them towards the habitat door. Now! He shouted. Michelle stole one last look my way. Her eyes rimmed red with tears and fear. And then, with the two security guards holding cattle prods behind them, they were forced into the habitat. As they stepped forward into view on the other side of the glass, I stepped up next to the suit, rage and panic overcoming me. This is the stupidest fucking idea, you dumb shit. There's only two in view, and there were- I was cut off as something slammed into the side of my head. My vision went blurry, and I collapsed to the metal in a heap. Shut the hell up, the suit said, motioning for the MP who'd used the butt of his rifle to strike me to lift me up. As they did, I looked up to see Michelle kneeling down next to one of the comats, my vision hazy. 
a thought crossed my mind. One that sped through my brain like a bolt of lightning and sent ice buckets of chills to zap down my spine. They have the intelligence of primates. They have problem-solving skills. They were watching us the whole time. They work as a team. They... I snapped my head up, screaming. Michelle, get away from it! It's an ambush! But it was already too late. As she looked up at me, her eyes white with understanding and terror, the Komat snapped up out of playing possum, lunging forward faster than I thought possible with its jaws agape. They snapped around my colleague's head, and I heard her begin to scream, a high-pitched, unending one which pierced my ears even on the other side of the glass. At the same time, the others removed their camouflage, leaping forward at Clancy and the two guards. They tried to raise their prods, but couldn't move quick enough as the three of them overwhelmed them, dragging them to the ground. The other Komat playing possum had leapt onto Clancy. Within moments, the glass was stained with the splashes of blood from my colleagues and the guards. Close the door! The head suit screamed, all trace of bravado having left them. But again, it was already too late. As with a mix of hisses and low growls, the seven genetically engineered killing machines dashed out of the enclosure and began the slaughter. I didn't stay to watch it though. When I saw that the four in the enclosure were goners, I turned and, with my head still reeling from the rifle butt to my head, sprinted as fast as I could away from the room. I saw a few others of my colleagues do the same and heard the eardrum-piercing sound of multiple handguns and rifles being fired behind me. Along with the screaming, God, the screaming, it was like listening to the background of a horror movie during a nasty kill scene. Only this time, the horror was very real. I thought fast as I heard the skittering of claws on metal somewhere behind me. I did the only thing I could. I climbed tables and bookshelves until I was able to climb on some ceiling mounted pipes and air ducting. I was up high enough that even if they could jump, which I would find out a few seconds later they could, as they leapt almost five feet off the ground towards me. It wouldn't be high enough for them to reach. From there, all I could do was watch. Watch in horror as the Komats grouped together as a pack, moving through the facility to kill the few colleagues of mine and guards who had escaped the initial carnage. They always found them, no matter where they were. They sniffed them out. They could spot them hiding in places most wouldn't think to look. Very soon, the entire lab was splashed with blood on the floors and walls. It looked like they'd attempted to make their own macabre version of a Jackson Pollock painting. But the most frightening was when they came to a locker that the last guard had hidden himself in. I know those animals had never seen a locker door before, but somehow one climbed slightly on the metal, using its claws to hook into the grooves, turn its mouth slightly sideways and grip the lock between its teeth. It gently pulled it, and the weight of it swung the locker door open. The cart managed to let out a single scream before they were upon him. Finally, they were all gone. Everyone except me. I saw the Komats fan out through the lap, systematically moving through each room. Two reached the stairs, and I heard the click of their claws as they climbed towards the door. A few moments later, they slid back down, trapped by the lockdown the big wit had set up. I let out a sigh of relief, but it quickly died in my throat as I saw one, what had to be the pack leader, move with a speed I didn't know they could possess and crawl back into the observation room. There was a sickening sound of flesh and bone tearing for a minute or two. Then it reappeared moving back across the lap with something in its jaws. I strained to see, then gasped as I realized what it was. It was the hand and wrist of the suit. The creature had torn it from his corpse. My mind raced as I watched it move towards the stairs again. Please, no, I thought. Please don't let it be that smart. My heart sank into my stomach as I saw the Komat reach the panel next to the stairs, climbing up and using its front legs to hold itself in place. Very gently, it dropped the suit's hand from its mouth, 
letting it fall palm down onto the scanner. After a second, a robotic woman's voice spoke throughout the facility. Lockdown lifted. All exit doors now unlocked. Shit, I whispered as I watched it drop back to the ground. And, moving in front, led the seven back up the stairs. A minute later, I felt the air pressure in the lab change, signaling they had managed to open the door. After about 30 seconds, it stopped. They got out. That was the thought they repeated over and over in my mind. They got out. Oh god, no. They got out. And that was how they found me when they came to search for everyone the next day. When the big wicks didn't report in. They found me clutching the ceiling ducts, almost desperately so, so as not to fall down to the ground. They ran a ladder up and coaxed me down. I thought I would be charged for the deaths of everyone here. But apparently, these people knew about Project Varanus. They took me out of the lab, away from the dismembered bodies of my colleagues and the others, away from the blood and putrid copper scent of it. When I stepped outside into fresh air, I immediately noticed the huge hole in the fence opposite us. That's how they got out, I whispered. And the man in the suit nodded. We know, doctor. Don't worry. We'll find them. From there, they made sure I was okay. Then, made me sign even more NDAs, stating I wouldn't breathe a word about what happened. All which, I said at the start, I'm breaking now. Yes, they financially compensated me for what I experienced. More money than I would ever know what to do with. Hush money. But I can't stay silent on this. For two reasons. The first being, all of my colleagues' families were given some bullshit cover story about how they died in a gas leak and the bodies were too contaminated to be able to be shipped home. The families deserve to know what really happened to their loved ones. And second, and more importantly tenfold, is to warn people, warn you, warn everybody of what is out there now, sliding and hunting through the forests, maybe even through suburban neighborhoods, where they can camouflage themselves. If they could be anywhere, you need to be on guard outside, no matter where you are. How many animal disappearances since they escaped could be their work? Hell, how many missing people could be their work? If you even think you feel eyes on you when nobody's around, run. If you think you hear soft hissing and low growling around you, run. It may not matter though, where they're so fast, even if you run they'll most likely catch you in. Well, you know what happens next. But, that's not what frightens me the most. That's not what makes me stare up at the ceiling fan in my bedroom, unable to sleep. The eggs in the habitat were destroyed by the military. They saw to that. But, the comots out there can still breed. And we saw how 90 eggs came from just those seven animals, those three females. They can breathe very quickly, and they will. And when they breathe, they will spread like wildfire, able to live in both hot and cold climates. And as it's almost April, it's almost prime time for them to mate and lay their eggs, which would hatch this fall. That is, if their breeding season wasn't genetically altered as well. All I can say is, I'm so sorry for what I helped to create. I'm so sorry for the deaths of all those who worked with me. And I'm so, so sorry. I'm so sorry. For what is to come. <laughs>